Good evening, and welcome to the historic Orpheum Theater. Here are just a few reminders before we begin tonight's show. Please look around you and locate the nearest emergency exit door. In the unlikely event of an emergency, please proceed calmly to one of these exits while following the instructions of the Orpheum staff. Also, the aisles must remain clear at all times during the show by order of the fire department. At this time, please silence all cell phones and pagers. If you feel the need to text or check your email, please do so in the lobby as it can be very distracting to the performers and those sitting around you. Smoking is not permitted in any part of the building. There is a smoking area located outside the back lobby doors. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the show. Good evening, everyone. Hi there. Welcome to the Orpheum Theater for the latest conversation in the Broad's Unprivate Collection series featuring artists Mark Bradford and Sharon Lockhart and writer, critic, and art historian Katie Siegel. I'm Joanne Heiler, the founding director of the Broad Museum and the Broad Art Foundation. The Unprivate Collection series of artist talks began four years ago, two years before we opened, to introduce our new museum to Los Angeles through the artists in the collection speaking in their own words. We've had a wide range of speakers on stage, including Broad Collection artist Thomas Hausago with musician Flea, Kara Walker with filmmaker Ava DuVernay, Robert Longo with musician and writer Henry Rollins, and David Sally with Hilton Else. Four years ago, our hope was that these events would help inspire people to come to the Broad and see the collection. The artists and cultural leaders who've been a part of these talks are a large part of the reason why we're now very close to 1.5 million visitors to the Broad so far. It's especially meaningful to us, thank you, it's especially meaningful to us that the Broad serves a wide and inclusive audience and that it has become a thriving destination and a gift to Los Angeles that our founders Eli and Edie Broad intended. Now a bit about tonight's program. Sharon and Mark are two LA-based artists whose work has brought them each international acclaim. Mark has had major museum exhibitions across the country and many awards and honors, among them the MacArthur Genius Award, which he received in 2009. Sharon's work has been featured in numerous museum exhibitions as well as film festivals internationally and she is the recipient of awards from the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation, and most recently, the Herb Alpert Foundation. Both of these remarkable artists have been part of the Broad Collection for decades, I'm pleased to say. My first studio visits with each of them took place, actually, when neither of them had a studio. <laughs> but besides those connections, the common thread between Sharon and Mark and the focal point for tonight is their exhibitions at the prestigious Venice Biennale in Venice, Italy, currently on view until November 26th. Sharon, though an American artist, is showing in the Polish pavilion due to her work with teenage girls based in a home outside of Warsaw. This project has resulted in a series of meticulously composed photographs and film, as well as workshops and publications. Titled The Little Review, in homage to a Jew Jewish children's newspaper once published in Warsaw, Sharon aims to create a forum for the voices of children past and present. Mark is the featured artist in this year's American Pavilion with a timely installation titled Tomorrow is Another Day. Exposing the social nature of the material world we inhabit, Mark's project deploys everyday pieces of paper, posters and ads from the streets of Los Angeles, end papers from hair salons, video and more to create paintings and environments that allude to ruin and violence, but agency, and most importantly, possibility. During the run of his pavilion exhibition, Mark has partnered with Venetian women prisoners to help them establish and run a small business selling handbags and other items they made under his guidance. Sharon and Mark share a deep sense of social responsibility and are devoted to creating sustainability of both communities and individual lives. As complex and rigorous, as they are in art making, their activism, though executed differently, is equally thoughtful and grounded, as you will soon hear. 
They take hard, incremental, and practical actions, both small and large, that insist on hope even in the midst of our harshest social challenges. As Mark has said, his tremendous international success hasn't stopped him from working with the real world hard stuff. It's hard to think of a message that needs replication and internalizing more than that right now as we face crises within our own societal and economic fabric on an all too regular basis. Moderating tonight's conversation is writer, critic, and art historian Katie Siegel. Katie is the senior curator for research and programming at the Baltimore Museum of Art, as well as the inaugural Eugene V. and Claire E. Thaw Endowed Chair in Modern, <coughs> excuse me, American Art at Stony Brook University. She has curated exhibitions at the Haus der Kunst in Munich, the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis University, where she was curator at large, and most recently was the co-curator with Christopher Bedford of the American Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, where she helped bring Tomorrow is Another Day to fruition. We're so pleased to have her join Mark and Sharon this evening. A couple of quick details. Um, first, I think you already heard this, but I'll say it again. Please silence your cell phones and note that tonight's talk is also being watched by an online audience via live uh, video stream on the Broad's Facebook page. We'll have a Q&A at the end, so audience members are invited to tweet questions for our panelists using the hashtag Bradford Lockhart. For those of you watching the live stream, hello, uh, feel free to ask your questions in the comments. I'd also like to gratefully acknowledge our leading partner, East West Bank, for their ongoing support of these and many other programs. And now, please join me in welcoming Mark Bradford, Sharon Lockhart, and Katie Siegel. Thanks so much to Joanne, to Ed Petuto, and to the Broads for having us here tonight, and thanks everyone who came out. It's a great pleasure to be here with Mark Bradford and Sharon Lockhart, and it's sort of an incredible coincidence that they were both invited to represent national pavilions in the Venice Biennale this year. It's maybe, it's maybe less of a coincidence at this particularly electric moment of history that they were chosen. Um, and that these two extraordinary artists are also extraordinary people with a shared sensibility and sensitive sensitivity not only to art, but to people, to the social landscape that they work in, including people who are their neighbors in Maine and in Los Angeles, and people who are not so obviously near them or like them. Um, so we wanted to share what they'd done in Venice um, for everyone from their hometown who's not gonna be going and also to have a conversation about how they act as artists in the world. I think um, Mark and Sharon are often put in different categories, even though they're from Los Angeles, um, both living and working in the same city, not so far apart, but they recognize in each other something that really resonates, and I think it'll come out tonight. Um, so Sharon, each of them is gonna talk a little bit about their projects, and then we're gonna have a conversation, and then, um, open that conversation to the audience. Okay, um, well thank you. And this is really a great honor to be here with you, Mark and Katie. Um, so I'm just gonna go quickly through my um, Polish pavilion. It was really interesting to have my own pavilion at the Giardini. Um, and Not for long. <laughs> I know, it's almost over. But it was really beautiful to see all of the artists working. I mean, I think that was one of my favorite parts. Um, but this is the outside of the Polish pavilion, and we can go to the next. Who does the slides? The other oh. head. Yes. Um, so the exhibition um, was called The Little Review, which was the title of a newspaper that was written and um, edited by children from 1926 to 1939. And it was an insert into the main newspaper. So it was like 50,000 readers. And the newspaper was started by Janusz Korszak. He was a pedagogue. He ran an orphanage for children. Can we go ahead too, Ed? He, um, he wrote fiction. 
Um, these are some of the original issues of the little review. And ever since I found out about Janusz Korczak, which was in 2012, I had been wanting to get these translated. And there were 677. And so for years, I wanted to know what was in them. And so with the um, opportunity of doing the pavilion, I knew that this was a, a great way to get into that history. So I work, I've been working with these girls in a sociotherapy center um, outside of Warsaw for almost five years now. And um, the, for, we had made work together before, but for the um, pavilion, I really brought it to them that this is an international um, venue, um, that they would be representing Poland with me, would they be interested in doing this, and they were all excited. And so what we started off doing was we had the girls break off into teams and to really research and read all 677 little reviews, which no one in the world really knows about except people who um, are into education and children or um, people who uh, you know, were influenced by Korshak. Um, and so the girls read all of them and they formed debate teams and they chose which ones they felt were, um, should be translated for the pavilion. So each week we translated one. So there's 29 issues. And this is the first issue which the girls decided should be the first issue that's read. Um, and this is a letter from Janusz Korshak where he talks about what the newspaper will be and what the importance of news is. And it's about telling the truth. And I think that's so interesting in relation to what's going on today. Um, but, um, and the girls are writing their own newspaper for the last week of the pavilion. We're working on that now. And as I said, they were, they were not edited. Um, as the children got older, um, the newspaper became more political uh, because of the times. And the last newspaper was in September 1939. So you can keep going. Um, and then with the girls, we actually, they were able to access the archive, which is something I couldn't do for five years, but now because of the pavilion, all of a sudden I could do these things. So after the girls did all of the research and chose the, the issues to be translated, we actually went to the library and had a workshop with the archivist, and then we went back and I made photographs um, of the girls reading um, the little reviews that they, what they wanted to look back at. This one is, I think, one of like the most important images in the pavilion. It's called Ola, um, Politics Today, and it has the date of the newspaper, and it's 1939, and it just stares at you when you walk into the pavilion. And the photographs were really monumental, and I really wanted to honor the girls um, who, who, in a lot of ways, feel like outcasts of society. Um, and I actually, um, wanted, I incorporated the benches from the National Library into the exhibition and a clock um, because I wanted to kind of double this space and this idea of duration and to invite a to invite a viewer to take time to read instead of rushing through an exhibition and but to actually spend time reading and that the exhibition was durational and changed weekly with a new newspaper. Um, there was also a filmic component um, the installation, I worked with Esha Gudwardena from Los Angeles. I've been collaborating with them for quite a long time. Um, the whole exhibition was black and white. So there was, um, uh, I wonder if there's a slide. There's, um, when you turn around from the photographs, there's a plinth with the newspapers on it. And behind the plinth, there's an enormous black wall. And I just really wanted to um, embrace the, the, the darkness and kind of this make it a monument in a way, um, this little review. So behind on the two sides are the theater that you go back. And with the girls, I had worked before in nature a lot and doing workshops outside of the institution. And um, for this project, I really wanted them to be presented with no context and for it to be them and you 
And so the film starts off, uh, you just see subtitles, and it's one of the girls saying, Jeanne Dobre, you know, and she's saying, wake up, get out of bed, uh, it's time to line up, and it's basically how they wake up every day. So it's kind of addressing the audience um, in the biennial to pay attention. And um, then there's, I worked with a choreographer, um, and this 12-minute scene that the girls chose the duration themselves, they walk onto the stage one at a time, hold their position, and they each do a movement, um, which is choreographed at different speeds. Um, the girls chose their own movement, and they chose their own word, which um, the words came from their journals, and we do a lot of writing back and forth. They'll write to me, I'll get it translated, I'll write back to them. So I made a big boards with all of these words that kept coming up in all of their journals, and we translated them and had the Polish words, and we asked the girls to choose which word, um, you know, had something to do with them, mm -hmm. or they felt like that was a word that they talked about a lot in their journal. So, for instance, there's one girl that says hope, and she said, my journal's full of hope. And another girl in the center, Paulina, she says trust. So she's like this pendulum. And then there's Kinga, and her word was just, that was sex. And then there was Gosha on the end, which is love, and um, Carolina is hate. And it's very interesting to, to spend the time with it because it's, um, it's very intense hearing those words, which are very simple words, but they're, they really pack a punch if you think about it. Um, then there should be another scene. Um, then the girls exit the stage and on walks um, Paulina, trust again, and she stares down the camera for about a minute and a half, and then she plays the piano. Um, and exits, and all of the girls through workshops years before working with musicians, I was able to get a grand piano, none of them had ever really played the piano, and it was really about not learning how to play piano, but like learning how to express yourself through music, and um, so they were very experimental. Um, the final scene is um, a live, um, vocal composition that the girls did. Um, and it's kind of hard to explain. So it starts, wake up, wake up. Uh, then it's the machine, love, hope. Then the piano, and then this is slow motion, choreographed slow motion, and it's three girls, one after the other. It starts off very playful. Um, one girl swings in with a, with a stick, smiling. And then the next girl comes into the frame and she's just so joyful and like expressive and happy. And, and then the next girl comes in, I think there's a slide, um, and ends the film. Oh, this is one of the workshops. What else do we have? Let's install. Um, and the last scene is Alicia um, coming into the frame with this stick and addressing the camera directly and just, you know, making a very powerful ending. So that, that's the exhibition. And then there's a series of um, workshops that are going on every month for the duration of the biennial. And finally, because of the biennial, I was able to get all of these nonprofits in Warsaw to commit to one month a year. So it ends in November, which is really sad. This is a workshop on Italy <laughs> this summer at the farm, right before I took the girls to Venice. So that's our map of Venice that we drew. And then this is in Venice with the girls. And it was really wonderful. A donor um, funded the, the project, so the girls were able to go to Venice and meet Mark and um, experience another country and a city without cars. So um, yeah, here they are again. Yeah. So that's my that's my pavilion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll go so, to your pavilion. Mark, let's see what let's see what you did. Poland to yeah. Right around the corner. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They were right around the corner. You know, it's yeah. funny. You look at you look. I'm 
stood out there so many times. <clears throat> kind of gotten some distance from it a little bit. But um, my pavilion was called Tomorrow's Another Day, and that's the last line from Gone with the Wind. And at the time, two years ago, I was really thinking about race and representation through cinema. Like how, how as um, a black American going to, going to Europe, what do they understand? Oftentimes what they understand about my culture is through YouTube or, you know, through, or through music. So I thought, let's, that was kind of interesting to start from that moment. But tomorrow's another day, very quickly, changed because, to be quite honest with you, the world changed dramatically. Not just a little bit, but dramatically. And I wasn't, I didn't have enough distance in my feeling to not, to, to not embrace it. So, uh, whenever I walk up to that pavilion, th the first thing I see is it looks like Jeffersonian architecture. I think of Monticello, which is basically a slave pl plantation. Well, with me being black, I certainly would not have been in the goose down beds upstairs. And so it doesn't bring up all of these kind of good feelings. It brings up this kind of um, trepidation. So I really wanted to turn it into a ruin, and I wanted to erase the border. So what I did was I had the same gravel that's, that is throughout the Giardini brought. Oh, OK, we'll talk about that. Um, <laughs> go back. No, don't go back. Yeah, go back. <laughs> and I turned it into a ruin. I put so much gravel that it looked like the, the structure itself was actually starting to um, submerge. So we can go to the next one. Um, also, I built a replica of the pavilion in a studio in Los Angeles. And the reason why I needed to do that for me was oftentimes you'll find that when you're doing a pavilion, it's almost, they almost, you almost feel like you're touring the White House. You'll have all these people around you and they'll walk you from room to room and they'll, what do you think? Oh, don't touch that, we'll get that. Oh, they make it so precious that I thought, oh, I'm not gonna be able to have fun. I'm not gonna really be able to, to, to play in here. And so I had to build it. And by building it, I made it my own. I gave myself permission to, Explore. Sorry, Katie, for the proposal that I gave to you because I changed it probably 20 minutes after I sent it in. But I, I needed to give myself permission. And also I needed to make work out of this kind of um, feeling of fragileness. I mean, really, it felt, like the, it felt like the world, as far as I knew, the bottom had collapsed. And I really sort of embraced that. I went with that. Um, it kind of reminded me in the early 80s when the HIV epidemic just hit like a Mack truck and, and nobody was kind of prepared for it. So I had that same feeling, but just on a national level. And although great things have started to come out of it, people are talking more about governance and people, but at that moment I just felt like it was collapsed. So I really made a poem and then I really started thinking, oh, we're nowhere near reconstruction, we're in collapse. And it was the same thing in the early 80s, people kept asking, oh yeah, what, can, what, what now, what now? And I kept saying it's too early. Right now, we're just, I think, in a, in, a, in a kind of a collapse. So I tested out and I played with this. It was down on Alameda. And this became my site. We, we can go ahead. Ed. Oh, that was the, and the, the, the poem was about Hephaestus. Hephaestus was one of the Greek gods who was born not perfect. And he was expelled from Mount Olympus because of his imperfection. And somehow I kind of related to this idea of that, that the center had collapsed and that kind of liberal thinking was starting to kind of be pushed to the edges a little bit more. So I would say that the peripheral is massing and that we will have to navigate that space as maybe a little less protected than we used to think that we were. So the idea of danger started to creep into the work and expulsion and I kind of went to the big narratives, you know, Greek mythology and biblical and because we're in, that, we're in that time when everything is big and biblical. It's like AIDS in the beginning in 1981. It was like, you get it from a mosquito. No, you get it from Jesus. You don't get it from Jesus. You get it from, it's, yeah, like, it, it was all biblical. And so some of the stuff that I read on Facebook is almost biblical. It's like, all right, so, okay. The Facebook warrior, right? Um, so the story was about this kind of young person being ex pushed out 
and about wandering and about a middle passage and about coming into his own strength. You can keep going in. Yeah, you can just, so the, fir the first room, and I kind of wanted to hit you with that. I wanted to have a physicality. I wanted you to walk into the first, I call them salons, and I wanted you to physically have to navigate around the peripheral. I wanted you to feel your body. Because I'm so unusual, my body is so big, it's six foot seven and a half, I'm always aware of my body. When I sit down, when I get up, I don't want to sit in front of anybody in the theater. You know, my heart panics, nobody wants to be in back of me. Um, and so I wanted the viewer to feel pushed to the, 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 the peripheral. I wanted this collapse. And I also wanted almost two things. I wanted this disease. This disease had gotten into the landscape of, of even modernism. They talk about a fly in the buttermilk, something that's, um, even though I'm very much of a painter and I'm interested in the history of painting, I'm not interested in leaving it pure, like, like pure, so the kind of fly in the buttermilk. Um, and also, there's something that has gotten into the fabric of, of, this, of certain parts of this country. So as a viewer, you, you're pushed to the peripheral. And it's funny, though. I tell people you can, you can touch the sculpture, but since it's still so supplanted in art, they're always scared. It's, it's touching it, except for the kids. The kids slide underneath it. And, ah, you know. and Diego, my assistant, he touches it. You know? <laughs> um, so, and so the second room, it's interesting. I had never given myself permission to kind of go back to where I started from. I used to use the material from the hair salon, and because I used to be a hairdresser. And for me, that was a way of connecting material from the social fabric of where I came from and a conversation with art history. But that didn't quite work out that way. People became so fascinated by the material and South Central and the hairdresser, they kind of buried me underneath a little bit. It's totally fine. I just believe that in a practice, you just keep moving. But in this, this room, I really wanted to make paintings that had like a, that felt liquid, that felt, that felt water, that I would use um, the stain from the paper that made this, it's called Medusa, and um, the water from the inky black paper, I would dip the, 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 the tissues to make the paintings. And for me growing up, um, I thought all black women were Medusa. I thought they were all fearless, you know? I, I grew up in a hair salon, I listened to all these stories, and I thought they were, you know, women were always turning men to stone. And so that was, you know, I'd look, I'd look. And so for me, that was like my, my kind of youth, and I, I got a lot of um, strength from that, because when I started to become bullied and called sissy and, and the, the usual things, I didn't really internalize it because I saw so many women that, that, that navigated around it and, and, and were just like these fearless people. I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. So it didn't go really internal. So this room really had to do with kind of, I would probably say um, the paintings have this kind of water feeling and they have this real depth and you have this kind of coiling intestinal thing in the middle of it. And I, I, I didn't want to do just the paintings without the, the, this kind of inner gut in the middle, but it felt too precious to me in a way. Um, we can go ahead. Yeah, you can just yeah, keep going. Um, so the rotunda was always the difficult part for me because truly it is the middle passage of the pavilion. And for me, I just thought, OK, let's go with this idea of middle passage. And when I would look up at the oculus, it looked like we were submerged. It didn't look like I was standing on the, f on the, the kind of um, nautical chart and looking up. I felt like it was submerged. And so when I got there, I had a completely different idea. And the, 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 the brochures were printed up with it. And it was all in the newspapers. And then I got there, and I knew that it wasn't right. Now, I tend to always give myself permissions, um, even when other people don't give me permissions, to change it. Um, because I, I have to live with it. I, I have to live with my work. Um, and so for me, I really started to think about a space that was submerged. A, where would people take their rage if they lived in this Monticello? Like, where would the, the, the women who were subjugated in the, where would they would dig out this kind of subterranean grotto, and they would put their rage in there. And I probably had a little bit of rage at the time when I was building this, making this, which is interesting, and it kind of worked together for me. It became a grotto, and it became, I, 
And because the middle rotunda is, it feels the most like governance. I wanted to strangle it. I wanted to like coil it and, sh and, and just pull all the life out of it. And so I just really, um, me and um, my team that we work with, I really worked with the architecture and I worked with the fissures and I created this kind of site specific. Um, and the first thing that I do is I always push back everything. I put white paper and black paper over all the architecture to kind of push it back and make a palette. And I stayed probably inside there for mm, 48 hours. I don't think we left much. Because when something is unnew, and of course the stakes were high, and this is probably not the best place to try out new ideas, and I was telling myself that every 20 minutes as I was doing it, this might not be the smartest place to do this. But I felt it was necessary because I wanted something that felt a little uncertain. I wanted something that felt a little bit not so seamless. I wanted to show the, the hem of the dress a little bit. I don't, I, sometimes I don't like everything just to be perfect. As perfect as I am, I don't like everything <laughs> to be perfect. And I felt like that, that vulnerability and that experimentation would breathe something else into the pavilion that I didn't have when I built it in Los Angeles. Um, the, the, the kind of, as you move through the middle passes, this is really about Mark kind of owning painting. Um, I always say that I'm an abstract painter, but I, I pull kind of um, figuration out of it, or I pull the social out of it. And these really m m molecular, I mean, really, I was thinking of the site of the body as a structure and how it can break down when there's dis-ease in it, or, but using almost the body as a, not even a metaphor, but something that was standing in for some of the political things that I was thinking about or some of the, um, you know, things that were happening in the press as we were making our work. And it was so interesting to me because everyone kept asking me how I felt. Constantly, other artists, everything. And I thought, well, how, well, how would you think I feel? I feel just like you. And it was interesting, Sharon, we talked about it. A lot of artists just would sit around and talk about the problems of representing a country. Um, what does that mean? And um, it, was, it was a very intense experience, but I, I, I grew a lot. It's kind of been the belly of the beast at that moment. And I don't know what this is. I guess this is just me talking. I don't know. A little $2 shirt on. We can keep going, yeah. Um, and so I really wanted to end it with something that really, this is, a, this is a video that I did years ago, and I'm almost, I don't know if I showed this at LAX with Lori. I can't remember, but. OK, OK. <laughs> but there was something about this video that, that, that when you sort of, how do you, how do you create the counter narrative? Sort of how do you get past the kind of narrative of South Central, the kind of sort of misogynistic you know, view through, through music. I always, point, I always love to point to other details. And this is Melvin, and he walks in front of my, my studio. And he has a walk to him, he has a very particular walk. But what he embraces is a kind of strength, a vulnerability, and the possibility, the possibility of something great happening or the possibility of violence happening. And I think that this idea of navigating in, in, in space and a, a certain f fragileness, but a kind of strength as well, is something that I wanted to end on, because that's really, for me, what it meant was tomorrow's another day. As, we, as I move forward, I will move forward with my fragileness, my vulnerability, but also strength. And I wanted to leave it on that, and he moves away from the camera. And I made this video five, six, seven years ago, but I never really, I showed it, but this was his home. This became, this was really its home. And, that, and then you walk out of the pavilion on your own feet, your own body. You, em, you embrace your own body again. Okay. And are you just going to go right into? Do you want to go? Do you want to talk about the other, your other foot, your other? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, the thing. Uh, well, the same thing. I mean, it's the way Sharon collapses both. Um, I did it probably a little bit more separate than she did. I mean, she really collapsed it in the pavilion. But when I was there and just sort of navigating around, I, I was very fascinated with discovering a, um, a collective, a men's 
and the men's prison that, that work with filk screening and making bags, and, and the female prison that um, actually the director allows them to sell produce in front of the prisons on Saturday, and the whole community of Jadeka comes out, mm -hmm. and also um, products. And I thought that that was really great, because when you think of Venice, you don't think of a prison, and you don't sort of, it's, it's like the tourists, it's like Las Vegas of the 1500s or something. And so I really thought that there, there could be a combination or a way of having a dialogue and working with kind of communities of need or, or an urgency. And so I, have been, I was going back and forth for a year and we sort of developed a, pro, pro, a, pro, a project that will last six years. Now I think maybe because I'm a merchant, I go immediately to like, like merchant economies, macro, micro merchant economies that, that can create sustainable platforms that people can make a living. Because that's what I grew up in. I grew up in a micro, micro, micro hair salon. And my mom and many other hairdressers worked in there. So this became their own kind of store. And we developed, you can just go forward. Um, and I, but let me, let me be very clear. When I was asking them what do they need? You have to stand back, be discreet, and listen. And they were very clear with me. They said, we want a physical footprint in Venice. We want a store because people don't, we want to not be invisible. We want to be made visible. And so, it, it, so the, the project really came out of them being very clear about what they need. It's the same thing with the girls. And what we, what we have to be mindful of when we're working with communities of need is to listen. You can't go into communities of need and tell them what you need. I mean, that's not the right approach. And so slowly, 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 we've been developing this program. Uh, it, it's been a collaboration. It's, um, it's going to be a sustainable program. And I've never seen that both the men's prison and the women's prison were so involved in the prop program. When the store opened, they gave all the people in this program passes to come to the opening of their store. And all of Venice showed up. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable Can that people ahead, were Ed? coming to sustain this project, that, that, that the people of Venice understood what the project was, and they were coming to sustain the project. It came from Venice. It was sustained by Venetians. and. It was really, it just really was incredible. And so people would ask me, well, what does the Venice Pavilion have to do with Rio Terra? And I said, everything and nothing, or you decide. That it goes together because I decide that it goes together. I made a limited edition bag. Um, no, it's true, right? You should see, it's like me and my partner, Alan DeCastro. We go together because we go together. <laughs> Um, and this, is the, this was the opening, and these were the people that I've been working with in the men's prison and the women's prison, and they all were able to get past this, and they were all there, and they own their store, and when they leave, so when they leave the program, they're able to have a site to receive mail, to work in the store, and to learn to integrate back into society through merchant economy. And the thing about Venice, they have a long merchant economy. That's what Venice is known for. So in some ways, I think that it might be easier because this, they understand this kind of merchant economy. And it was, now that I'm, now that I'm actually thinking about it, it and the, the Venetians understood. Like, we know if we spend our money here, it's helping this program. And so rather it's, I would say rather it's grass tops or, or grass roots or in between, all of it matters. Like, it all matters. Mm -hmm. And so that was a great day for me. That was as great a day as, you know, winning the Golden Lion. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wasn't that really? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Everybody got quiet, like, doesn't he know? <laughs> he didn't know. Didn't he get that memo? <laughs> but that was a great day. It was really a great day. And um, that was a great day. And there was another moment, and I was telling Sharon back, back um, in the green room, we gave, a, we gave a, a talk. 
and um, she had, she, and, and Sharon came to the front of the, oh. the stage. Can you go ahead, Ed? Can you and go ahead? And all of the girls yeah. in the program just rushed towards her. Well, mm -hmm. I think they were really yeah. excited. No, to no, no, too. no, no. Yeah, but like, it, no, but it, it was, it was, it was a moment that I'll never forget because that was, that was trust. Yeah. And, and I love the fact that they were running towards an artist. Yeah. That Two. they were running towards an artist as the role model. That's right. Mm -hmm. They're role models. No, why not? So that was a great, that was a great moment. And, and, yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you both. Um, and I think, I think that was a powerful moment for, for everyone mm -hmm. to see that happen and that yeah. come together. So could you say something, Mark? A little bit, and, and Sharon, about what you what you see in each other, whether it, what you saw it that day, or you realized it, you know, Mark, when you read Sharon's proposal, or when you saw each other's work, or, you know, in a lot of ways, I think that opening at Rio Terra was more exciting than the opening yeah. of the of the Biennale, yeah. and it was more exciting when we went back and those kids you saw, um, Mark, talking about his paintings. Those were kids from Baltimore, from oh, three okay. colleges in Baltimore. We brought they them back great. to teach when Sharon brought the girls from Poland and everybody was together and that was more fun yeah. than, than the opening in a lot of ways. But, but what you saw, what you see in each other, you know, whenever you saw it, whether it was that day or that. Well, I can say one thing that, I mean, I'm, I hope I don't start crying, but you just have such a beautiful ability, the way you work with people. But I just heard you sitting there talking to kids saying, you're this little tree and people are gonna peck at you. And, you're not gonna let them peck at you. You're gonna look up at the sun, and you're gonna look at your watch, and you're gonna just keep growing, and you're gonna maybe make a wall around you. Mm. And I was like, God mm. damn it, that was amazing. <laughs> you know, and everyone was just like. Oh. No, what do you mean? No, but it's true, I mean, that's <laughs> life. It's like life is hard, yeah, and yeah. a lot of the people that we relate to have hard lives, and yeah, and yeah it's just like an honesty, and yeah, a very, you're an incredibly generous person, and you just don't need people like that in the art world so often. Well, I just and, saw our passion. Hmm? I just saw your passion. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah thank you. Also, mm -hmm. I just want to say that a lot of my practice always involves these like behind the scenes things, like Katie's yeah. known for years and you know, I ne it's never public, like yeah. mm -hmm. all of that. And the exchange and the workshops or these other things and so when I was actually um, awarded to, to do the pavilion in, in Poland. The budget was so tiny because it was Poland. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do the educational component mm -hmm. and because that wasn't considered the art. The art was what hung in the pavilion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And nothing would be made if it wasn't for the exchange that I have with the girls with all of these amazing thinkers that I bring in from Poland to work with them. Um, and because of Mark, I was able to do that. And so that's why I'm saying the girls were very excited oh. to see you because when I was like, he's the <clears> one <throat> that made the workshops possible. They were like all over him and just like thanking him because there's nothing in, yeah, the, cool. in, in the social Artists therapy. helping artists. Artists helping artists. I mean, artists. that's like, I mean, that's like yeah. for me, um, the great thing about this project is it, 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 the, the, it exists in, in the kind of, fabric of society. Yeah. These are not like art projects. These are projects, mm -hmm. the girls you work with, Rio Terra, these are projects that exist in the world. Yeah. But here you are and here I am deciding that we want to move into that site mm -hmm. and that we have value in that site. I don't know why or when we didn't think as artists that we can have a fluid border. Mm -hmm. We can be in the art world and we also can participate outside of the art world. Mm -hmm. I love, um, I love, I love when they kind of look at me as other, sort of like, oh, you're kind of non-traditional. Yes, I am. <laughs> you know, yes, I am, and this is what this looks like. But it's okay if I'm, if I'm in a room full of more conservative people and we're having a conversation. It's, it's um, if we're not in the room, mm -hmm. how will they know what we do? Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing that I was thinking of when they all rushed to you. They were rushing towards an artist. They were not rushing towards a woman who has to go home at five o'clock to make lunch for her husband, you know. And there's a word they use for Sharon. What was it? Sharonka? 
They kept saying it. Which is crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah it's crazy. crazy. Right. That's yeah. it. It's an English yeah. word. Because it's they crazy. didn't have a yeah. word for a woman that kind of does what you do, but that's good. Yeah. Like, I didn't fit the model. <laughs> you didn't fit yeah. the model, and they yeah. need to see women yeah. that don't fit the model. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I'm in, that's right, right? A lot of them. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. When you're talking about South Central, they need to look at counter narratives. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a foundation. Um, Alan and I, and it's called Art and Practice, and yes, it is in South Central, and yes, we do show contemporary art, and it doesn't look, it just looks like contemporary art, and people come in all the time, and they say, well, this is not black art, and I say, yes, it is black art. He's black, and that's his art, black art, <laughs> right, right? You can't, um, you can't simplify and reduce yes. down a community, but, if we're not moving out of our kind of cultural silos and giving local communities access to what we do, then we really can't be upset when there's no relationship to it. Mm -hmm. If we're constantly asking to go on the little school bus, that's what I did, I got on the school bus, mm -hmm. and um, I drove across town, and I went to a museum, it was like going to church, and you whisper, <laughs> that's hard, and I go, okay. But I felt nothing. I felt no, I got back in the school bus and I went back to my site. Mm -hmm. But if on the way to school or on the way to the store, there's a contemporary art space right in the middle doing what we do. And we're not judging, we're not saying anything has to be different. It's just part of the social fabric. That's what it is in Lamert Park. It's just a site on your way to somewhere else. And if you, if you wanna stop in, it's great. We have a sandwich, sandwich board. It says free, and it's open. Mm -hmm. Also, I just wanted to say one other thing. Um, the girls from Poland, are, a lot of them have lost touch with their siblings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the program yeah. that your studio yeah. developed where yeah. they can find their siblings because they've been in the system, and the yeah. system loses them. Yeah. And when the girls heard that yeah. you invented this or uh -huh. whatever, they were all hopeful that, wow, maybe I can find my sister or my yeah. brother. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these I mean, are the, like huge things. For yes. Huge. And I think the part of that, I mean, following Mark around for, for the last <laughs> year and listening to people ask him stupid questions, I mean, I think that the, the number one stupid question after what do you think about Donald Trump was, is what you do social practice? Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, everybody is just like they want to label communities and people, yeah. they want to label what artists do, but nobody, almost nobody asked, well, what is it that you're doing, mm -hmm. and what are the steps? Mm -hmm. What is that process, yeah. and, and how could we maybe copy it? Is it worth it? Does it work? Is yes. it worth copying? It does work. Yes, and, and but like, how can we do that? Yes. You know, so yeah. siblings is such a good example. That's great, but need and access. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, I, I would sort think. of need and access. I rotate between two things. Of, um, I, and I do sometimes think we can make the mistake of not, not actually, oh, this is actually um, art and practice. This is art and practice. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's Sean, and he actually he helped he, develop the app for siblings. And siblings basically is an app that there's so many people in the foster youth system that lose track of their brothers and sisters. So we developed an app, it's still in beta, where they can load all their information in all of the, the homes that they've lived, and they'll come up with possible matches for a brother or sister. And that's just something, you know, hey, Sean, what do you think about that? Well, yeah. clap for Sean. I mean, yeah. You got to get the young techie people, because I run in and have all these great ideas. Sean, you know, what do you think about this? And he's like, ugh. <laughs> but, um, but again, so what I was thinking is sometimes we believe so much in contemporary art that we believe the world just needs what we do. And we just want to give everybody access to it. That is, and I do believe in what we do. But at the same time, when you're moving out of these kind of, these kind of, these of social, these silos, these cultural silos, and you're moving into communities that have what I call more urgent needs, mm -hmm. you have to be a little more mindful of those needs while we give them access. Mm -hmm. And what we, in, in, in art and practice, so we work with foster youth, mm -hmm. um, first place for youth, to deal with people in need, foster youth, 18 to 24. And we also have a contemporary art space because I believe in giving the local community to what we do. Mm -hmm. But I think both. It has to be a plus sign in the middle. Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's the thing that some, we forget about the need part. The access part is like, we're down for that. Mm -hmm. But the need, it's not sexy. You know, it's like, 
girls, you know, they need jobs, they need psychotherapy, they need places to, to live. It's not fun, but it's so needed. And so, th and so this, is, this is an example. You know, I think Mark has really, you've really managed to codify, like you're really good at figuring out what the structure is that you're doing. And so need and access, mm -hmm. you understand it. You've got clipboards and maps and you're just like really organized. Oh. And, and then and, you have me. And then there's Sharon. <laughs> But I mean, you no, have, but, but you've just, done it's, the it's, same you know, thing. But it's, yeah, it's, you, you yeah, do it. But you just do it in a different way. Can you it's talk about very, like what you did with the girls and how you identified what their yeah. needs were? Well, um, in 2009, I met this young girl named Elena, and um, she was nine years old. And when she was 12, she was put into um, a, a center, and. And then another center, and another center, and over the centers, every center said Giannis Korshak. And I'm like, who's Giannis Korshak? Mm -hmm. This man is so important, and I never heard of him. So this, that's how that started. Um, but she told me at that time that she wanted to write a book about her life. And I thought, mm -hmm. I'll, that will be my catalog for an exhibition. Mm -hmm. And I'll help her write her book. Mm -hmm. And she knew she wanted me to take the picture for the cover, and she knew where she wanted it taken. And um, so I spent a month with her and her brother taking them from two centers to try and bring them together while they still had a childhood um, and trying to help her find her voice. And then she ended up in Rochenko. And in order to be with her and the book and the catalog, all that long past never happened, mm -hmm. um, I hired a philosopher and we had classes on a farm five days a week for the girls. So it was 15 girls in Milena, and they would come to the farm for these critical thinking classes. And they were, this wasn't one of them, this is a couple years ago. Um, but we'd have them in different locations every day. Um, but then after that I realized they don't need to talk. What they really need, and that's about listening again, mm -hmm. is they need, a lot of other things like um, learning how to breathe or learning how to say what your opinion is and write it. Mm -hmm. um, like they didn't have the word for opinion. Well, yeah, they didn't never heard the word opinion. And then after they, I kept saying, what's your opinion? And they would translate it into Polish. Then everyone told me every day, well, in my opinion, in my opinion. <laughs> so it's, it's really about just like, it was about Really, from Korshak, it was all about the child's voice. He wrote a book called How to Love a Child, The, the Child's mm -hmm. Right to Respect. This is in the 20s, um, much before children's rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was a contemporary with Lewis Hine. So, mm -hmm. of course, if it was today, they'd know each other. But they were doing very similar things for children. I mean, you both have, and you both have really strong feeling for those people who are in between, in that vulnerable teenage kind, mm -hmm. of, kind of place that other people don't want to deal with. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's... Not even teenage. It's, it's just in uh, people who need a little help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who are, for, for no, no fault of their own, mm -hmm. or are in a situation that, yes. for whether it's educational or whether it's family, and they find themselves somewhere. But what is wonderful is when they want to do more. Oh, God. That's what's wonderful. Yeah. And if you can support that, mm -hmm. they need to meet you halfway. But when they want to do more, you can feel it in them. The women that I work with, it's not all the women prisoners and all the men, but the ones that want yeah. to work in the program, mm -hmm. they show up. Mm -hmm. You have to show up. Mm -hmm. But if they show up, I think that I will, I'll meet them. Mm -hmm. And so I think in some ways it probably heal something in me because I remember when I needed, yeah. I was trying to get it going mm -hmm. from the oops, you know, mm -hmm. and, and really needing, needing that help. And I think you showed that them, showed them that about yourself and that was, and they really responded to that. Like you didn't come in and say like, I, I understand everything, I know everything and I'm gonna give you something. You said, I've been messy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I tell the girls. I think the girls know more about me than like anyone, <laughs> because but you help them. Because though. no, because we, we have these journals, so they write and I write back, and uh, and yeah, it was never like um, 
giving a lecture. Like, so this slide is kind of not normal because usually it's like everyone is on the same next. level. Let's do the next one. There's no hierarchy. This is one of the workshops with the choreographer. Maybe there's some more. And, and all, of the, the, um, all of the people that I hire to bring in, I'm just trying to turn the girls on to as many things as I can and mm -hmm. like positive influences and so they can try and find their passion and then to try and help guide that passion. Um, I think this is something that's so, is, yeah. go ahead. No, but this is art now, so. Um, and the line is, you know, for you a little more, like Mark said, a little fuzzier for you. But I think that's that one of the things that's so unusual about both of you is the listening and the observing so closely. I have rarely seen people listen so hard to other people or look so hard at the world around them. Um, but also the time you put in, like you were saying, you know, there's all this stuff under yeah. underneath, mm -hmm. you know, and Mark and I this morning were looking in the studio at a book that he and his studio made mm -hmm. of the whole process of getting ready for the Biennale. And it was just huge. It's as big <laughs> as the catalog. And so much goes into it. It's like below the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. You know, so Mark's in Venice for six years with the lease for Rio Terra. You've been working with the girls for how long? Five years. Five years. So, so this is a really different model from well, the consistency. going in. Consistency. Yes. Yeah. You can't tell someone, you're, I'm going to help you for three months and then yeah. peace out. It yeah. just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, don't, don't offer someone something if you are going to pull out. Mm -hmm. And it can be more devastating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can be more devastating. You have to really decide what your, what your commitment can be. Mm -hmm. And you have to find a sustainable, realistic model for that. Mm -hmm. um, I never wanted to be um, kind of the drop-in guy, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that. I, don't, I, didn't, I made, we made a commitment to be in the Mert Park mm -hmm. and to put down roots there and to kind of develop the foundation there. Mm -hmm. We could have gone other places, but to, you know, like a, a, a commitment. I think that, um, I think we can just remember what it was like to be super silent mm -hmm. and needing so much help but not knowing how to ask for it. That's mm -hmm. what I kind of got. Mm -hmm. And it, just, it wasn't that long ago, so finding their voices, their yeah. opinions, the same thing with the, they all, the women, especially the women, they, with the shame. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry that I'm in prison. I'm so sorry. I said, stop apologizing. Mm -hmm. So the girls did that to me too. They were like, why do you want to work with us? The men never did. Like, we're, the, we're bad. <laughs> Male prisoners never apologize. But the women constantly would po apologize, mm -hmm. constantly. I'm, uh, thank you so much. I said, for what? You're the one uh -huh. doing all the work. You're, you, so it's. Um, you made people feel seen, you know, mm -hmm. when you talked about making visible. And yeah. I think that's something. Do you want to say something about, do you want to say something about the girls, the statement? Oh, yeah. I mean, I just wanted to say these photographs, these are from Rachenko, another film I made with them. Um, I'm, a series of photographs, but it's titled from one of the girl's journals from the year before. And so the series was inspired by her writing and the photographs are called When You're Free, You Run in the Dark. And it's all about being free and, and yeah. And so this is When, when You're Free, You Run in the Dark, Bua. Um, but a, last year, I think, or two years ago, the girls made a zine and I, actually published it so that it could be in the bookstore in mm -hmm. Venice and translated it and also had it in Polish. But they wrote an intro and I just think it's so beautiful so I want to read it because it's something they did together. Um, who are we? Girls from the Youth Sociotherapy Center in Rochenko. What are we? We are different. Sometimes we are happy, sometimes sad. Each of us went through something else. Each of us has different interests sports, books, music. Some are strong, some are weak. Some are open, some are self-contained. For sure, we are not like other people want to see us. We hear pathology, perverted brat, outsider. We hear we will not go far. We lead others astray. We don't respect people. It's because people don't know us. They don't listen. Why did we make this zine? To prove to people that kids from a youth sociotherapy center are not worse, maybe they just need more attention, to not be afraid of us, to try to understand us. People judge us by our appearances or by the fact that we are from a sociotherapy center. So listen, 
don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge our zine by its cover. So beautiful. That's amazing. Yeah. I think, you know, I think that's part of, part of what being an artist lets you do, is you can see the big picture, but you never generalize, either of you, about people. You see everyone as an individual. You don't generalize about groups. You don't judge. You just see the material, like you're looking at material paper. Yeah. Yeah. without seeing the representation, yeah. you know, the cliche. And so even though your work is so d different, it's something you both bring to your social projects. Yeah. And yet you're, able to bring, you're also able to bring people into, together into groups. Could we look at 62? And then we'll, we're going to open it up for questions in a minute. Um, so, so I think maybe I'm one of the, the last the few things. And so this, you want to say who this is, Mark? Um, you don't to, if you don't know everyone's names, that's That's fine. Alan, actually, my partner standing there. Looked like he's in charge. <laughs> he is in charge. He's not wearing a hat. He is. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's Diego. It's, it's, I think it's everyone that works in my studio. Oftentimes, I'll work in the studio, and I'll say, oh, OK, we're going to do something in Lemur Park. And then we load up the, we lo we load up the, um, the, the trucks, and um, we go to Lemur Park. And this was. I love kind of billboard material and kind of wheat paper pasting. And so on this building that we own, um, I went back and did the whole history, kind of looking at Lemert Park from when it was sort of started. And we kind of went through the whole kind of history of Lemert Park. And that was really interesting. Some people didn't know that it was, it was done by Walter Lemert. And um, it, so it was really interesting, because you have a lot of dialogue with the community. And um, I like to sometimes be out on the street communicating with people. Or back then I did. I got more busy now, and I went back to the studio. Alan really is the man on the, on the, on the, on the street. I guess I wanted to ask, you know, what does, what does knowing that history, you're both so sensitive to mm -hmm. history, and you're not like research artists who go yeah. and like make a big conceptual art artwork with yeah. text and all of that, mm -hmm. but you're both very intuitive about thinking about history. You mm -hmm. read, you know stuff, and it's part of that iceberg that's under the water for both of you. You know, so what does knowing history do? Does it help, and does it help you deal with a difficult moment, like we are in this difficult moment, okay. and people are thinking, what, what are we supposed to do, and what can artists do? You know, and I think there are a lot of artists hiding, there are, you know, and not knowing what to do, feeling like suddenly they're the wrong artist for this moment. I think you are the right artist <laughs> for this moment, but does, does history help you well, I'm think always, about it? I mean, I'm like heavy, like, I always make these like readers and research, but then I take it into the world with me. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Can we and, go ahead? And, and a lot of times, like, yeah, like the BIW workers, the shipyard workers from lunch break, I mean, I would bring in so much research and one, share please. with them, and then they would share with me. And like, for instance, they, re they did a remake of the Lumiere's workers exiting the factory mm -hmm. um, called Exit. This is research imagery that they saw. So it's just a way, like I never show my work. I always talk about like how things are represented in history mm -hmm. or how things are talked about before. But like in Poland, it was crazy. It's just gotten crazy the last couple of years. So, um, you know, it's also tough when I was working because it was funded by the government, you know, all of these protests, are, they're trying to take away women's rights um, for abortion. They're trying to take away the freedom of speech. Like, all of these things are happening. And, and um, the girls didn't know anything mm -hmm. about it. You know, they're isolated. They have no, they can use their cell phone maybe a half an hour a day. Um, you know, so it was like bringing news and history into them was really important. Mm -hmm. Bring, bringing Korshak into them, that was... Mm -hmm. Like ha talking about today Going in to relation to then, mm -hmm. you know. Do you f and Mark, does that does it work the same way for you? Can we have the next one, please? Or does it? I mean, you've uh, done so much research. You've excavated. This is 1992. Yeah. And you've History is an iceberg. Mm -hmm. You know, it does move, but just really, really slow. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 things, and things do change. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's what I always remember. The, 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 the interesting thing about like, w history is constantly being reevaluated and changed. And if you think about South Central, South Central is what, 50, 60% Hispanic? Mm -hmm. The narrative of it doesn't change, but the actual on the ground, it changes. And that's why I like to be on the ground, because that's where you really can see where things change. Interactions mm -hmm. with people, the interaction mm -hmm. with shop owners, the interactions, mm -hmm. that's where you see it on the ground. You don't see it in the record industry because they need to make money to keep it static. But the great thing about kind of urbanity, if you want, if you will, it's constantly moving forward. And things, the, the land doesn't, we, you rent it for a while. You rent a neighborhood for a while, and then another group comes and rents it for a while. It doesn't belong to anyone. So that is something. And I always do a lot of uh, research when I'm looking at, I, I'm a big history buff. I've always been a big history buff. But, not just art theory, I like art history, plain old art history, I like political theory, um, anthropology, cultural anthropology. It's really interesting though because they'll, be, they'll have art theory in this section and then everything else you have to go to cultural anthropology mm -hmm. or to the African studies program. And, and I think that that's actually a mistake. I think that theory and art history and cultural anthropology and should all why does it have to be separated out? Mm -hmm. So I would have to go to all these different departments in school to get all the books that I needed. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then I'm kind of mindful of taking a subject position. I'm not speaking for anything. I'm just kind of doing mm -hmm. something that, and, and, I, and I'm very clear about that. I'm not, mm -hmm. uh, I'm very clear about this is how I view something. It's not, I didn't say, it's, it's my interpretation of something. Can we have the last one, please? I guess we talked a lot with, this is the corner of the world. The corner of the world, honey. Get your hair done, $85 for individual braids. I know her. Uh, I do. Um, and uh, yeah, the, this, is, this for me was so interesting because it's the collapse. It's the collapse of so, these are the moments, there's certain images that point to a kind of a racial changing where kind of um, Latin speakers or people are coming into the neighborhood that used to be South Central, and this is where it collapses. This is, you see where it says cucarachas? Um, that it clearly is in Spanish, but then you have the braids, which is clearly for African American women, back then it was. Um, and then it's like the, this is, now here's, here's another interesting thing. This, this, so you have these little fairs that are for young kids, that's for little kids, and they're like, you know, kids. But why would you name it Hustler? Like, I don't, like five-year-olds, like with, you know, ice cream cones, Daddy, can I go to Hustler? It's just wrong. <laughs> There's just something really wrong about that image. It's just really it's uncomfortable. <laughs> There's something about that moment of like uncertainty. Yes, you that's know? a moment of uncertainty. And I feel like we're so there. Uh, we, right we, are, now. we are in a moment of uncertainty. Do we tear things down? Do, how do we continue history? Monuments, what is history? We, yeah, Tell us about the present. What is it? What is the, our relationship to the Civil War, to the rise of fascism? And I think, I think both, neither of you, it feels like, I mean, do you, you called your, your exhibition Tomorrow is Another Day, but neither, and you're both doing something. You're like, not hiding from the world. Do you have a feeling of optimism or yes. like going forward? You know, yes. I think people are so uncertain. You're optimistic. I'm kind of scared. No, I'm not. <laughs> in the world Listen, right now. But I'm, no, I, I'm not like a, like a Pollyanna optimist. It's mm -hmm. going to take yeah. hard work. There's going to be. Um, it's going to get bad. It's gonna, it feels but like it's getting bad. It, of it's course it's there. getting. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> But what, what, what is that, in the early um, AIDS epidemic, um, when everything was just collapsing, people started to really bond together. That's when the whole AIDS, you know, Act Up LA started. People started to do, and these were just people who communicated and they had a commonality and they started doing things. I think that right now we simply can't wait for permissions. Yeah. I mean, in Poland, they were able to stop two, they vetoed two of the... Right. Yeah. So I don't think it's about so waiting it, for permission. I yeah. think it's something that people. artists bring. I think it's something that you bring, that idea of agency, of people who do stuff and know how to make stuff work and not just tell other people to do it. Mm -hmm. That is a different model. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. Well, that's what an artist does. I mean, mm -hmm. we run our own little companies and sometimes don't even get paid for it. We mm -hmm. build it, we conceptualize it, we, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we do everything. Mm -hmm. So, but um, I don't think we should wait for permissions. I don't think that we should worry about if, if, if this is the appropriate move. If, if you feel a strong urge to do something, because most certainly this, this people, um, other areas of the United States are not asking for permission, so why are we asking for permission? No. I don't think that, I think that we should give ourselves permission to think mm -hmm. as, as open as we can, mm -hmm. and to make relationships with possibly with, with each other that we haven't mm -hmm. met, made before. And this is such a great example of it, and you've both yeah. done such amazing work over the last couple of years, and you just made it all up yourself. Yeah. So. We did. That's the craziest part. And I'm sure people, other people have questions, things they'd like to say, and I don't, there's some special, special way that, that we're doing it, the Broad people. What do you got? Oh, wow, Twitter, huh? Yes, let's, let's. There's two pages. There's two pages. And so you all tell me when to stop. Um, well, he, here's an easy one. Mark, is the replica pavilion still up in LA? No. I, uh, oh my God, I was so upset. I, I didn't told, know until I, I got here. I never came back to it. I told him to tear it down. I didn't want to get, I didn't want to make it precious. It was a model. I played in it. When I went to, I never came back because I didn't want people to take it and move it to want to show it somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's gone. It was an idea, mm -hmm. you know. You know what? I was kind of thinking that too. Broad people. Um, is, can people just shout? Are we going to get in trouble? You don't. Need Mark permission. gives you permission. <laughs> you have permission. Honey, just you don't stand need up. it. Over there. Mark, what do you think about the uh, whitening of South Central and Brown Central? The whitening of South Central? I, that's a big question. What do you mean? What? 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 What is that? The, the browning. Are you, yeah, are you talking around like um, the metro, or are you talking like Baldwin Hills? Well, I can speak about what I, I have. I can speak about the things that I own. And I think that if I buy a building and I'm African American, that's, that stops a certain amount of gentrification because I own it. And I'm going to keep it a certain way because that is what the community's kind of said. So I don't think that three or four story condos are going to go up something I own, so I guess it's, I can speak about me, that um, being African American, being in the African American community, and buying real estate in Africa, African American, investing in that community, I think that's the best thing I can do. Okay. Over there. Okay, great. So, well, you, Sharon. Can, you can go first. 
I would say no. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, but that doesn't mean that artists, you're talking about the objects, I think I'm talking more about the artists, the, the physical artists engaging with the, mm -hmm. with the world. I think that you, you would never ask a lawyer, um, do you think he has real impact outside of the judiciary system? So I don't think that, I think that art belongs usually to a site, which is the art world, mm -hmm. but artists belong anywhere they choose to go. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between the object and the artist. Mm -hmm. And I believe that an artist, yes, can effect change if he chooses to navigate and move into those sites. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, but, no, but I, mean, I the, think like, I, oh God, I'm just like I was telling you earlier, the stupid TV crew was following around the girls in Poland which totally made me crazy, I had to stop that. But they were interviewing one of the girls and they asked her why she was in the center and she said, that's my personal life. I'm not here to talk about that, let's talk about the art. And I was like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> that is amazing. But she was owning it. And then I think back to like the BIW workers and mm -hmm. like seeing their artwork next to Calder or Gustin or it's like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do think, I mean, I do and I don't. Like, I don't think art's gonna change the world, but at the same time, I think it's, it's, it's kind of closed off in a lot of ways. And there's a difference between people looking at art and, changing, and the idea that people could do art or be creative yeah, or have some kind of agency. Well, there's a site for it, but there's not, there doesn't have to be a site for the artist. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I think that I see them very um, independently mm -hmm. in a way. I have no problem being, being a painter and kind of navigating those spaces. Mm -hmm. But as an artist, I, take, I give myself permissions to go and navigate and create relationships anywhere yes. I want, it, want and to. And that's uh, why it's more interesting what you do than how we name it or think yeah. about it so or that's, organize it. That's, that's how the I problem. Feel. We get stuck too much in that kind of question, like yeah. what, what is it? Yeah. Um, is, there, is there anybody else who has a question? Could you, could Do you I have a translator? Um, I never had a translator until, I think for the pavilion, and that was, we used English for the first time because it was an international um, venue. And um, I use a translator for translating the journals and then usually the people I hire are, um, you know, uh, movement therapist or choreographer mm -hmm. or musician mm -hmm. or philosopher. So it's like everyone's on the same level with no hierarchy. So it kind of works when my assistants and I don't understand what's going on because we have to ask mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. or they'll hear me make a fool of myself mm -hmm. trying to speak Polish. And I think we, we saw in Italy, Agata Gravante, who's oh, here yeah. tonight, Agatha, yeah, um, was the liaison and translator for so much of the work with Rio Terra. And you could see, oh, you know, Limerick Park, okay, you're from there, you, mm -hmm. you know, but no, like there was no, there was not a real, mm -hmm. you know, boundary to yeah. working no. with people and finding a connection. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And body language says yeah. a lot. Like I communicate with my body a lot and I think mm -hmm. you do too. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe one, one more question from, from the audience or from Twitter. I don't know which one. <laughs> So, so do you feel like so? Do you feel like your work aligns itself with you know the state and left-right politics and electoral politics, or do you think you're up to something 
something else? Or do you see yourself? Or maybe not. Well, I'm not going to carry all that. Yes. Yeah. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, it's like, I think it's unfair to, to ask artists to carry all that. I'm not going to carry, if, if my work has certain uh, roots or relationships to things, that's fine. But I'm not going to carry all that. I mean, I'm not, I, 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 I uh, um. So I'd say maybe, yes. <laughs> And so maybe that's what's so, what that, that is so inspiring, that we get tired of those conversations about... I've never been in that conversation yes. before, which is very, I think because of Poland now, all of a sudden, you know, some... But, you know, if we, if we have constantly these us, you know, mm -hmm. us against them, and you belong here or not here, what it will stop, it will stop true communication mm -hmm. among people. Because we're so polarized, we actually become static. Mm -hmm. I think that the thing that we must, or it would be interesting to do, is active. Mm -hmm. active. Not be so frozen by the politics that we truly can't move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if we make mistakes, we start it again, or we try again. I think that it's basically, for me, I didn't start art and practice with this grand meta narrative. Mm -hmm. I didn't start Rio Terra with grand, so I don't think that you started with Ruchenko. It's just, it came from an impulse to want to do something. Mm -hmm. And I just simply built on that. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. I don't, and I don't say that I'm perfect, nor do I say that I'm not constantly reevaluating what I'm doing. This, I'm constantly changing and reevaluating my practice. Mm -hmm. Things that I thought years ago, I don't think of so much. But this is a, this is a, a work in progress, people. Um, this is not something that's static for me. And we have to move away from classifying and labeling. There's something else we can borrow from science that's experimenting and testing, and like test and retest, and trying and retrying. And that kind of process mm -hmm. that you both go through is inspiring. And I think the thing to take away that we could all try yeah. That's worth worth everyone trying. So I want to thank you both for such an inspiring year and an evening. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>